You're listening to Guitar Talk with Dave and Michael. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Guitar Talk. You have Dave here. And Mike O. Today, we're going to jump right into it. Mike O is telling me that he's been jonesing lately for a Mesa. How did that start? I don't know. (laughs) It's like I woke up and must buy Mesa Boogie. I, you know, I don't know what's going on, but all of a sudden I got a hard on for one, you know, and uh, I used to work for him, uh, you know, and uh, oh, shit, man, I got some I got some pretty cool stories. Actually, I used to own a Mark II C plus that I bought new when they came out so that would have been back like in early 80s. Bought that from uh, making music in Chicago. Had that forever. Made the mistake of trading it away to a guy that owned a music store for something. And I have since sold the something, but um, but with that being said, I, you know, I just started looking up their gear again, and uh, and you know they they definitely got some cool stuff. Um, some of the cool stuff is no longer in production. I was I was surprised, like wow, they don't make Road Kings anymore, they don't make Roadsters anymore. Um, you know, a, a few of the things are not on the current wa- roster, but on the current roster. Um, at least right now, what's looking attractive to me is the um, TC100, so the Triple Crown 100. Okay. Are you familiar with any of the models that I mentioned? Um, not the Triple Crown, no. When I left working in the music stores, the Express, is that what it's called? The Express 50, 25... The Lone Stars were big. Did you know um, Rich Longacre over at Mesa? Was he there when you were there? No, that would have been after me. Uh, the, oh, okay. the guy, the SoCal, they had a SoCal rep for a very long period of time, and his name, his name is, and or was Kevin Parker. Kevin started at Boogie when he was seventeen, and he was sweeping up in the shop, and then he graduated to paint booth and. A bunch of other things eventually got into customer service and eventually got into sales and then he was my rep um when they only had two reps for the country they had a guy in the east coast and a guy in the west coast and uh he was my rep you know whatever and then they decided to add a third rep and uh, i interviewed for the job and the interesting story there was I didn't know this at the time, but my boss had interviewed for the job. The guy that owned the music store that I worked at yeah, uh, be- before me. And then he didn't get it. I interviewed for it. I got it. And it was an uncomfortable thing at first because I you know, told my boss I was going out of town for a family thing or something. Flew out to uh, California, interviewed for the job. And it was right before NAM, And they were like, they didn't want to let me go home. I said, I got to go home. You know, I mean, Nam's not for another week yet or two weeks or, or whatever it was. And um, they wanted me to stay there. So I was married at the time and my ex boxed up a bunch of my clothes and shipped them out there. And uh, I stayed out there. But the uncomfortable thing was, is I had to call back and tell my boss, yeah, I really didn't go to visit relatives. I went for a job interview. I got the job. I'm not coming back because they, they want me to start immediately. And you know, then I had to tell them what it was. Right. And uh, yeah, it was pretty uncomfortable. But uh, me and that guy are still friends. I mean, uh, every, everything worked out good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I have a few. I mean, I bought my Mesa Dual Rectifier, I want to say. This was probably 2001. Mm-hmm. It's the version 2. I bought that at the Hollywood store from John. Yeah. And then... Um, and. And then later what happened was I had to take, when the version threes came out, I was working at Alva's Music. And um, I had a a problem when I was going on the road with this amp. I had a Line 6 DL4 pedal. You familiar? It's the big green delay that has the three different presets and then the tap tempo. Very popular pedal. And I was constantly getting phasing when I would put it into the effects loop. So I would only turn it on for a guitar solo, and every time I soloed, the thing would sound like Van Halen because I'm getting this phasing sound. Now, at first, it was driving me nuts. I'm like, am I not understanding? Do I have, like, a phase combination 
I mean, I was going crazy. Finally, I called line six, and they're like, no, it's not our pedal. That's their amp. So I call up Mesa, and they're like, we've never heard of this before, whatever, blah, blah, blah. They kept bouncing me back and forth to each other. I never fixed the problem. I just stopped using the effects loop. Now I'm at Alva's Music. I open them up with Rich Longacre, and I open them up, up as a Mesa dealer, and the version 3 dual rectifier comes out. And I'm like, well, what are the changes? Well, this one's a multi-watt. You can, you can change the wattage of each channel individually. I'm like, okay, that's cool. What else? We made the effects loop series and not parallel. And I said, well, what's the advantage to that? And they're like, you know, sometimes it would phase. I'm like, what? <laughs> I said to them right there, I go, you're fixing my fucking amp and you're making my, my loop series. He's like, just take it down to uh, John over at, at Hollywood. And, and they fixed it for me for like, I think it was 35 bucks. I was like, I'll pay it. So that was that. And so I had that. So that is a modified from Mesa uh, version two. And then on Craigslist, I saw this uh, Rectoverb 50, which is a single rectifier. And um, and I love it. It sounds great, but it's 86 pounds. It's not leaving my house ever again unless I'm playing, like <laughs> unless I'm doing a session because it's just not worth the taking out to a gig when I can use a light hot rod deluxe and throw a couple of pedals in front of it. But Mesa recently has released an amp that I thought was interesting. They came out with a 6V6 amp that has like four different settings. I think they call it the California Tweed which I can't imagine that would interest you because it's not really uh, what Mesa does. Um, actually, it, it's at this point in time, it's not interesting me, interesting to me in a purchasing sense, but it I it is of interest. I mean, the California Tweed. I mean, the Tweed amps. You know, that's what you know. That's where the original Marshall designs came from. And I'm being a big British fan. You know, there's much more of a connection between Tweed amps and Marshall than there is the Blackface and and Marshall amps. And because I'm not a big Blackface guy at all, I would you know you can put all that stuff to one side, and you know I I have no desire to play through any Blackface stuff. Um, but yeah, you know the the California Tweed looks cool, and the uh, Fillmore thing looks pretty cool too, which are two new you know right. newer product lines that they have. I was surprised that they got rid of as much stuff as they did from the last time I paid any attention to them because the uh, Mid-Atlantic looks like that whole product line might be gone. They had those little lunchbox amps, you know. I don't think any of that sold well. Like the Lone Stars do well. Uh, the Expresses were doing okay. But didn't they make like a, uh, a high-gain amp with EL34s to give more of a British sound? Is that what the Road King was? Oh, no, it's the Stiletto. Stiletto. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know who my uh, Bingham loves that amp. Yeah. He he thinks it's an underrated amp. He thinks that's a fantastic amp. I know he likes well, the stiletto a lot. You you know you know it's another um, good Marshall esque amp that uh, Boogie uh, made no longer makes is the Electrodyne. I really like that one a lot. It's it's a forty five uh, ninety watt simul class. It's either a combo 112, 212, or a head. And uh, that amp, I thought, it sounded great. You know, it's, it's a, just Didn't a Fender also channel. make an Electrodyne? Um, I doubt it because, you know, the way they are with trademarking names and stuff like that, both companies, I can't imagine that that, that got through without some kind of lawsuit or something like that. For some reason, when you say Electrodyne, I can see this weird looking Fender Flintstones looking amp. I don't know. I could be wrong. Someone look it up and put it in the comments. With that being said, um, if uh, the people out there want to go to the comment section, I'd love to hear, you know, their thoughts on boogie amps, uh, new and old, you know, uh, yeah. recommendations. Either way, stuff that they didn't like, stuff they do like. You know this, that, whatever. But at least for me, at this point in time, uh, the small amount of research that I've done—I mean, the Road King—they were making that 
right as I was leaving Boogie, because mm. I, I left Boogie in 2000. And uh, I know I uh, that unit, dealers had placed orders for that, but uh, none of them had shipped yet. And they didn't ship until after I left. I didn't even and, understand uh, what the Road King was. To me, it always looked like a dual rectifier in a fancier box. Well, you know what? It's part of the dual rectifier series because it did have that feature. You know, you could have tube rectification or solid state. But it, it it's a four-channel amp. Um, each channel is individually selectable, you know, with tube rectification or solid state rectification. So you can designate which one it's going to be. And when you channel switch, it automatically, you know, changes that for you. It also changes cabinets. It had an A and a B cabinet. And you could designate which cabinet for each channel. You could designate the wattage, I think, for each channel, the rectification, the cabinet, and maybe, oh, uh, that amp also had reverb, and so I think you could uh, reverb on and off for each channel, and then the level was individual for each channel. And then each channel had X amount of modes, probably three modes per channel. Um, pretty smoking amp. I mean, it really had a lot of bells and whistles on it. I'm not sure what the difference is between the version 1 and the version 2 on the Road King. If anybody knows that out there, feel free to post that in the comment section. Um, and then they came out with the Roadster, which came out after, and the Roadster, oh, the, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? The uh, Road King is 120-watt amp, but it, it actually has, oh, that's another thing that's selectable per channel, is um, you've got uh, four 6L6s and two EL34s, so you could have like a 50-watt kind of a crunch rhythm channel, and then you could go to a 100-watt clean if you wanted a high headroom clean, or a 100-watt really heavy overdriven channel or whatever. So you could make that selectable per your channels. Uh, when they went to the Roadster, not a lot of the, some of those features, you know, followed, but not all of them. That, the Roadster shipped with uh, four EL34s, and it would either be four 34s, four 6Ls, or four 6V6s, which is something you could also do with the uh, uh, Road King. And um, it, the Roadster did not have verb, and uh, uh, there, there was something else that that was different about it, you know. But but that was a four chain lamp too, and but you know, similar but different. And now this one I'm looking at this triple crown, which is in current production. It's a 100 watt amp with 34s. You can go six Ls or six Vs. Um, and, but it's got power scaling on each channel, which I think is really cool. Um, so you can, you know, knock a 100-watt amp down to, I think it goes from 100-watt to 50-watt to 20-watt to 7-watt right. to 3-watt. Yeah, they started and, that uh, whole multi-watt system. Way yeah, back. and it, and it's cool. It's per channel. So, yeah. you know, you can have them set different. And, uh, you know, it's it's... It's British sounding. It's it's Marshall sounding. I th I thought it sounded really good. They've got a. Uh, I'm gonna have to look it up. I got another computer over here on the side, but they've got a really nice, a couple of really good videos for it. There's one where Doug West, aka Tone Boy, is um, doing a uh, like a company demo. But then there's also an artist doing a demo, and it's some guy I never heard of before. But man, is he a good player? And he sounds great. He's playing like a Schecter version of a fender strat looks like it's got a roasted neck and it's like a you know light blue baby blue, uh, blue body three oh, like an coils. american an american made schecter uh are do, are there american made schecters now well they got a they got a well for years they had a builder over there um what the hell was his name was it shigeki the Japanese guy that was building Schecter USA. I think his name was Shigeki. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Shigeki. Uh, he's a great builder and a nice guy. Nice kid. Um, you know, my problem with Mesa, and I don't know if it's a problem, um, but the amps to me have what I consider a really processed sound, which is bizarre because it's a you know it's an analog type amplifier. But to me, if you took like a Marshall um 
like say the DSL fifty, or even say something more high gain, like the uh, the vintage modern. If you took the Marshall Vintage Modern and you put it with the mid boost and you compared it to the dual rectifier, it's going to sound a little bit more raw than the rectifier. The rectifier is going to be tighter. There's um, there's just something processed about it. And to me, it's funny because something that really wouldn't affect the sound so much is what you're using for rectification. You know what I mean? Whereas on something like an amplifier that's a little bit more raw, then those things start to matter. Like if you sat there and you heard like a, a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe and then somebody rewired it and put a tube rectifier in it, you would sit there and be like, ooh, this has added character to this Hot Rod Deluxe. I'm not sure it does a fucking thing in the dual rectifier sound-wise. I don't hear it. I don't notice it. Um, so I just always found that to be like, you know, somewhat un unnecessary. This, I mean, four channels is even unnecessary. I think three is unnecessary if, I mean, unless you don't want to play with a pedal. I mean, because any two channel amp, if you have a clean and a dirty, and then you can step on a pedal to throw it into, you know, like, uh, if you're playing a Marshall, you could throw a treble boost on it and really kick it into like a nice screaming lead sound. But for the most part, you don't need all that. You know, that's a, it's overkill. Well, a couple of things there. Uh, the pedal in front of a two-channel amp, in my opinion, now you have a four-channel amp because you got your clean sound with, let's say, this right. overdrive pedal, which, you know, yes. so it's kind of a bluesier thing. And then when you step it, step on the pedal when you're in your lead channel, now it takes it to, you know, an, another level. So you turn a two-channel amp into a four-channel amp. And for the most part, that's where I live. But, um, you know, recently, and I may have mentioned this in one of the earlier ones, you know, I picked up a Kemper unit and I've started to get back into um, what I'll call, I don't know what I'll call, um, like the techier side of things when it comes to gear, you know? Yeah. And and with, with, with that being said, the FX3 looks appealing to me by Fractal, you know? That that could sound a little weird coming from a guy that's been a tube guy as long as I've I've been a tube guy, but at, you know at the end of the day it's uh, it's a tool and if it does something that's useful there's nothing that's wrong with it and that's my opinion. But with that being said, when I was looking at the boogies, you know I don't need a two channel this I've got that I don't need a one channel this I've got that so I was just kind of looking and I was like oh yeah the Road King I forgot about that and then the Roadster and then I saw this Triple Crown thing. And, uh, I, you know, I was just like, oh, yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong with any of that. And, you know, if you look at adding a pedal to that, which I definitely would, now a three-channel amp becomes a six-channel amp. Or now a four-channel amp becomes an eight-channel amp because you can add an overdrive pedal to any of those sounds and, you know, open it up even that much more. As far as the tube rectification goes, you know, it's in the power supply section, you know, so, um, you know, so that's, you know, the, the AC coming out of the wall. That's where the rectifier circuit is in, in an amp. So it's not in an, in an audio signal path. And, uh, you know, it it does affect the overall performance of the amp because a tube rectifier is not as efficient as a solid state rectifier, meaning that when you, you know, when, when the demand becomes higher, when you're kind of pushing the amp, the solid state rectifier, I don't know if this is showing up, will keep up with the demand no matter what, okay? Whatever the demand is, solid state rectifier is going to do it. The tube rectifier won't. You're, you're demanding this and the tube rectifier just kind of like, it's struggling and it just can't supply what, what you need it to do. And so it's, it, it's more of a feel thing. It, it's right. sad. I was going to say, because just where, when you say it's efficient, uh, efficient doesn't mean better because most guitar players actually like that spongy, non-efficient hmm. feel. I you mean, know, Mesa makes great stuff. You can't go wrong. I just think if you're a young guy out there looking to afford, and I want to get into this at some point, we may as well talk about it right now. Okay. Um, you know, there's amplifiers that are affordable. A lot of guys out there are playing are, are anyone that can go out and spend five grand on an amp, the world's your oyster. You can go out and find whatever you're looking for, however fancy or however you want it to sound or however you want it to be. But if you're 
on a budget. Mm. That's the trick. And that's the trick in everything. So like when I would get a session call and someone's like, I need a cue for this movie and it's going to pay, uh, what, what do you need for it? You know, and you factor in what I got to pay the other people to come in and play, how much I got to pay the studio that I'm going in to use, how much I got to pay my engineer, what is it that I'm going to walk out at the end of the day? And then I call them and I tell them what the budget is and then they pay me and then if anything in that budget's fucked up, it's me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It comes on yeah. me. It's not like I can go back to them because we have an agreement on what the budget was for the queue. You know, the money aspect becomes really important. So if I see a player and I ask a piano player, hey, what would you charge me to come in and do a, a song? And the guy's like, I'm 500 a song. I'd be like, okay, well, this guy's, you know, great. Let me go to the greatest and this guy's three grand, well, now I have to think, can I afford to pay the three grand guy? Or will the 500 guy nail it what I need? And I think that's a, a question that a lot of people are asking themselves and why YouTube is so successful. When people are watching these demonstrations, everyone's watching, they want a new pedal. Everybody wants that. What am I going to do to sound like this guy? I mean, and I, I've said it on the show a hundred times. I've said it on my channel a million times, folks, it takes practice. It has nothing to do with your fucking gear. It takes practice. So practice. But having nice gear is good. And so I'm going to say this. The budget is 500 bucks. They're coming to you and they say, Mike, I have 500 bucks. That's the peak of my budget. What amplifier should I go out and buy? Now, it's a tough question because you should have some questions for me. Uh, well, yeah, the, the questions you know, would be what type of music? Bingo. Uh, you know, uh, what kind of guitar? Uh, pedals you're going to be using, you know, and I'm assuming maybe I know you as a player, so I know what your skill level is. You know, if I don't, then I might be asking some questions there, you know. Um and then, uh, and then I see, I think I would cut it short. I mean, for me, I would be like, my thought is what kind of music do you want to play through it? And that would kind of be it. If the person's skill level isn't good, it still doesn't make the amp I'm suggesting bad. You know what I mean? It's like, um, if somebody says I like playing clean and glassy and I love that 80s clean tone. I mean, I would tell someone, hey, go out and buy a Roland Jazz Chorus 40. Now, no matter how good or how bad they are, it's a great amp. Um, you know what I mean? I, if that's what they wanted to play, that style. Uh -huh. That's what I'm saying. If somebody said they want to play, because you want getting a get better clean sound than a Jazz Chorus, I'm sorry. Now it's um okay we're gonna have to agree to disagree on this one then uh i'm not a big fan of of the Roland jazz chorus amps at all regardless of the you know the 120 or the 40 or whatever uh, never been i you know I, it it just it's not my it's not my flavor of ice cream or pizza topping you know just you know it just doesn't work for me um but you're not that type of player, though. You, you, I mean, a guy who likes British amps and wants that Marshall sound, I mean, it's missing the one thing you want, which is tube crunch. You aren't going to get it out of that amp. But if you yeah, listen you to, like, some of the records from the 80s with that clean, glassy sound, that well, you know is what? a jazz chorus. There's no way to get... You can't get that sound with a tube amp. I mean, you tube amps... A clean tube amp is really not that clean. Ah, you know what? I am glad that this walked its way over to, to what you just said there. Because um, there definitely is, I think, a, uh, a perception of what a clean sound is or, or clean tones in classic songs, you know? And I think if people go back and listen to these classic songs from the 60s or 70s or whatever it is, they'll actually hear, oh, wow, I guess the guitar really isn't as clean as I thought. There is a little bit of gain there. And even to the point where, you know, like in a genre sense, like you can bring up um, 
Wes Montgomery, a jazz player, you know, most most notably known for kind of thumb and octaves, you know, sure. in his jazz thing. You, listen to how much gain that guy has on his guitar. It's amazing, well, actually. It's actually true on both sides of the fence. If you go to look at those records and you're like, there's a clean tone I want to copy. When you end up doing it and you end up using, like, uh, if you go through modeling amps or you start really, because when you use modeling amps, you really try to dissect the sound so you nail it. What happens is you find out is the clean isn't as clean as you think it is, and the high gain isn't as high gain as you think it is. Yep. Total agreement. Total agreement. You know what I mean? If you yep. if you're if you're at home and you're practicing like you're playing free stuff and you're a young guy and you like metal, you take that 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 gain and you bring that gain way down and turn the volume up a little bit, you're gonna get closer to his sound than whatever the hell you're doing now. Because it's not that oversaturated crunch, it's more of a blooming overdrive that's coming out of Oh, a cleanish style amp. It's a natural bloom. You know what I mean? It's like oh, yeah. uh, it's not that. And same with the Bad Company records, and and same with like, I mean, when you listen to Zeppelin and stuff, yeah, he's pushing those amps, and he's got the the um, the tone bender on it, but he's also playing a telly. You know, so it's like it's not like he's pushing the heaviest signal through. He's giving it a little help. But that being said, the reason why I brought up the jazz chorus, and I'm pointing over here because I have one tucked under my keyboard, uh, it's just a great clean amp for that kind of money. If somebody said to me, hey, I'm playing, I got to go out and play gigs, 500 bucks is my, my budget, I would suggest going online, looking on Craigslist, and buying something like a... Black Star amp, a 40 watt Black Star, anything that they can kind of get into that range. Otherwise, for that, and I would also suggest a Hot Rod Deluxe and putting a pedal in front of it. But I would even say if somebody's budget was 500 for guitar and amp, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest the Roland Katana as an amp. I think that's 299 or something. And then buying a shovel and putting strings on it. <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. No, I just didn't know where the hell to go with that. What are you going to get for 200 bucks? A squire? I mean, it wouldn't matter. But I'm just saying, the budget thing is really tough to do. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, as, as far as my input on, on, on the budget thing, um, uh, Black Star's not a bad place to go. Well, first of all, you got to be used. Total agreement. Craigslist is is would would be a good place to go. Locally, if not, maybe you're looking at Reverb.com or something like that. But um, Black Star or uh, I I'd probably be looking at a Jet City. You know, oh, yeah. which is the, which is you know that three 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 thing. You know, it said Mike Soldano designed. Yeah, you know, made, made over, in China. You know, in yeah, kind of a thing. Bang for the buck. Those amps are really nice, and you could definitely walk away with five hundred or less for anything up to a hundred watt. You know, two chan two channel. Do they still make them? Oh, yeah. Do they still make those amps, or you have I to think, buy them used? I I think they still make them. I hope oh, they do because yeah, I've thought never the seen the one on the used. Product. I've never seen one used. That's why I'm asking because I remember when they came out. Uh, that was like two thousand six or seven. With the Jet City line, because uh, at least that's when I became aware of them when they came to West LA Music and tried to get me to carry them. Uh huh. Um, now they, I've got a um, I've got a Jet City. I don't know what it's called. Maybe an HD 100 or whatever the hell it is. So it's mm-hmm. basically you know, it's basically the SLO of that of the Jet City line. And right. I, I bought it used. I bought it used when I lived in Nashville. So it would have been before. Before 2014, somewhere probably, somewhere probably, somewhere between 2012 and 2014, and I think I paid like 350 for it or something like that. Right. You know, yeah. and it was clean. You know, and uh, actually, I used to have an SLO. I got rid of it 
because I, you know, I, I didn't really think it was worth the hype, you know, and and nor the money. And I thought that that thing w- was every bit as as good as, you know, I mean, it it was in the ballpark for sure, and yeah. it was a he- hell of a lot less money, you know. And I still have it because there's no reason to get rid of it because, you know, I've got 350 bucks into it. Now, I'm actually while we're talking, I'm going to get online and just see if Jet City is still an entity. Yeah, the website is still active. You got the Amelia. It's a 50-watt, two-channel EL34, 6L6 head. You've got the 100 HDM. So I was close. I said it was HD or something. Yeah. Um, You've got a 100 Limited. So that one's got the white chassis and the chicken head knob. So it's more Soldano looking. Yeah, what do they charge for that? I don't know. Um, Well... I could read more here, but oh, I thought you, says, oh, you're on this site. I thought you were on Reverb. My bad. No, I'm on their site. But you know what's interesting is this 100 Limited. It says coming the winter of 2017. Wow! So they really yeah, so updated not, their site. <laughs> yeah, which might might mean maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe they're not kicking anymore, um, or or maybe they're just bad with the website. I don't know. So I clicked on that limited so I could take a look at it and there's absolutely nothing there. Uh, let me, wow. so that, so that means that that product is no longer in the line. Cause now I'm looking at the actual, that's product how line limited itself. it was. Yeah. It's yeah, so it's limited. Not, it's not yeah. showing it at all anymore. So I'm just clicking on one of the other amps now just to see what it pulls up. So it pulls up the other amp, shows the specs, it's this, that, whatever. Uh, interesting. It shows shows a boy a Boise, Idaho address for distribution in the states. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, so I'm clicking on their Facebook page now. Let's see what the last post was. You know the date on it. It shows the Amelia here. Which that might be a three channel amp. It's got chrome chicken head knobs. I mean, it's kind of cool looking, I guess. Um, oh, you know, I had to say this it's one thing I've always hated about the rectifier series were the knobs because you can never tell where it's set because you got these round chrome knobs with a little dimple in it that's chrome, also. I think I used to put black paint inside the yeah. little dimple, you know. Because I could never tell where, where the hell those things were turned. But uh, I also think for, if you are looking under 500 bucks for an amplifier, anything on Craigslist, you're going to find a, any Fender, the Hot Rod series, uh, mm-hmm. Blues Junior, um, not so much the Pro Junior. I think it's too cheap, and I think it's it's small. I mean, if you're looking, you know, if you're looking to save some money and you're going to practice in your house, the Pro Junior. Although the Pro Junior is what uh, two of them is what. Jackson Brown had been going out live with for years. Really? The, uh, yeah, he goes out with two pro juniors. Huh. I mean, but they're, they're great amps. And, you know, you could use anything Fender. You could find use for under 500. I would say, I don't know. I know you like, you. did you say you like the DSL 50s, the new Marshalls, the, um, the combos that they're selling? No. Oh, okay. Um, I, actually, yeah, I'm not, you know, for what it's worth, you know, anything anything after mid-80s, aside from some of the limited edition stuff they've done, I don't have any interest in with Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of the limited edition stuff, they did a Jimi Hendrix head. They did a JTM oh, yeah, 4500 uh, head. So Paul Harris, who's now with Cordoba Music, uh, he used to be with Fender, and before that he was with Gibson. Mm-hmm. When he was with Gibson, I sold him the Jimi Hendrix full stack in, Ouch. Purple, in purple Tolex. I bet that was a lot of dough. Uh, well, I mean, I gave it to him at a price that he couldn't say no. Okay. I had a gun to his head. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, he uh, he loves that amp. He's a such the he's such a great guy. Um, but you know what's funny? What I cannot stand, and it's a pet peeve of mine, is people who talk about the 80s Marshalls with such reverence, and yet when I ask them what they got, they're like, I got a JCM 800. Yeah, 
Yeah, what model? It's a GCM 800. Yeah. Yeah, they made a lot of models in the 80s under the uh-huh. JCM 800 series. Perhaps you could clue me in with a model number. You know what I mean? Like a 2203, a 2204. Those are great amps in the JCM 800. You've got the 2210 and the 2205. I have no interest in in the JCM 800. The JCM 800 even made a 1959. Yeah, they did. They had a super lead. Absolutely. They had the super lead. And and they they also made a JCM 800 uh, 59 base. Yes. Yeah, they, well, they, they, what was the base called? Uh, super, uh, super base? But what is the number? Like that? 86? Oh, yeah, you're right. It is. It's a different number, but I, yeah. I'm zoning out on, on the yeah, number. Right. Super base, I think, is an 86. 1986. You know, on the Facebook page, the last posts were in the summer of 2019, so it's not that long ago, but that's a while ago. And um, it looks like they were selling used stuff you know like stuff that came back to the shop for like a repair or something like that and it looks like they were trying to clear it out now um i just clicked on jet city amplification on musician's friend um and uh it's not not active the brand yeah i I don't think they've been around for a few years that's just my guess i mean yeah yeah, it looks like I have gone. to be honest. I thought they were gone a lot sooner than that because I hadn't seen them. I would have guessed 2015 or 14, but I mean, who knows? But uh, but you know, there, there's definitely used stuff on. Um, I always I used to see it on Craigslist all the time. I didn't see it the last time I looked, but there's definitely used stuff on Reverb. If anyone's looking for any of that, problem. here's my problem with it and why I never carried it when I worked at West LA. Mm-hmm. They came in, they told me the whole Mike Saldano story, and my mm-hmm. whole my my response to them was, "Great, let me play the amp and I'll tell you what I think." I don't really like when somebody tries to tell me the backstory of something before I have an opinion of the product, mm-hmm. but whatever. But I played it and I'm like. I don't like it. I didn't like the amp. I thought whatever amp that they brought to show me wasn't impressive. And for a Chinese made amp, I was like, yeah, I don't care. So then they're like, oh, but there's going to be this model and that and Mike Saldano this. And I'm like, I love the Saldano amps. I think they sound pretty good. But this does not. So I hate the whole, let me tell you the story. And, Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Just buy whatever, you know, if it sounds good. It sounds good. You know, when Black Star came out, Black Star's thing was, here's our story. We're the guys from Marshall. We walked out on Victoria Marshall, blah, 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 rah, rah, rah. It came out, and they weren't that good. They were okay. Now, was it in the design, or was it something else? I don't know. The, a couple of years later, they were getting pretty good. And I think it well, might have something to do with the manufacturing aspect of it. Well, they changed... Um manufacturing like a lot of people did i think they ended up in vietnam or some crazy place making amps uh with that being said um the artisan series there were a couple of good amps in that part of the line which is the uh you know hand-built part of the line as opposed to brand circuit board and um i thought they were too pricey though but if you could get one of them on a deal um they're good amps. Yeah. You know, they, like I said, they if you have... can find somebody on Craigslist who bought one and is just trying to get rid of it, you'll tell by the price, offer them less, and you'll you'll get like even the Club 40, the new ones that are coming out, they're decent amps. They sound good. And you can dial them in to sound better. They sound better than when I remember the first run came out. But either way, it's like I just hate the story with stuff. It's like, here's the story. Oh Christ. It's about a man named Brady. <laughs> busy with three. <laughs> bam, 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 bam. Here's a story of a fucking amp company that is making stuff over in China. Oh, you These know what? Amps suck, um, but we got a big amp maker to attach his name to this product. I imagine he did okay. I imagine. Uh, yeah, what's what he doing? He's sitting at home while money comes in. It's called yeah. mailbox. I, I, Everybody in I, the I, world, I, that's your goal in life, is to make mailbox money. It's when you don't have to leave the house and checks are pouring in. Which, that's the goal. Which it, 
Which I have to agree. And at that point, you're talking some type of intellectual property yes. because that's what's going to pay you and continue to pay you. Right. Now, and so so he did that. You know, Soldano did it. Uh, Herr Bogner did it. You know, Reinhold, you know, yes. you know, with the Bogner uh, and line six. And, um, you know, there, there's some people oh, that didn't. There's a lot sell. more that did it. I mean. But there's people uh, that did not Jim sell Tyler out. Did it with Line Six with his You're guitars. Right. You're right, but uh, but there are people that did not sell out. There's some people out there that just like, no, we're just gonna. Oh, I, don't know, I, would, I don't know if I would call that selling out. I, I don't know if I would call that selling out. I mean, if somebody came, to, if I were an amp builder, uh-huh. and somebody came to me and said, "Hey, listen, I have an amp company. We have a huge factory." We make and sell millions of amps. I would love for you to design the um, the gain stage circuit of something that's going to be a solid state power stage. And um, we'll use your name and we'll pay you X amount of money for it. I'd be like, okay, I'll design it. I have to make one US one. Then they go make copies of it, put my name on it and sell there. Uh, of course, I, w- I don't think that that's selling out to the point where both parties are 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 getting a, something from it. You know what I mean? Something of value from it. Because what it does for people who can't afford a Bogner amp, it's it's buying a line six with Bogner's name on it. So now when they become, I need to go buy myself an amp. I'm going to stick with Bogner. Yeah, but what what it might do, and maybe it was a poor choice of words on my part, but you know, with the selling out thing, is um. It might give the impression, wrong or right, that oh wow, you know, this is a Bogner. It's not a Bogner. It's a Line right. Six amp no. that may yeah. have some kind of Bogner design in it in right. some way, shape, or form. Yeah, maybe all of it. Maybe he sat down and from start to finish, you know, designed the whole amp. I don't know, but you know, it's it's not it's not a Bogner. You right. know, just like. The jet but I don't think they were not- selling it as a Bogner. I mean, we 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 used to carry them, and it was a Line Six. We would say it's the Line Six with the Bogner, um, the preamp that he designed. The preamp. I mean, you know, whatever that is. I love Bogner amps. I think Reinhold makes great stuff. I think he's crazy, and and I think that makes it even funner sometimes. <laughs> you know, um, I I don't know the man. I've, I've I've seen him at the Nam show. You know, and and. And uh, I talked to him a couple of times because I know I was in the booth yeah. and and checked out the stuff. And this was before, you know, anything really took off for him. And the backstory on him is, you know, making music, you know, this goes back to the beginning of this conversation where I said I bought a Mark II C Plus back in the day, brand new from making music. It was Greg Bales on the store. They were in Chicago. It was a really cool store. He opened up a West Coast satellite store at one point, and guess who was his amp repair guy in the back? It was Bogner, you know? Yeah. And actually, Greg was the guy on the front end that was that put the money into the Bogner stuff, you know? So if it wasn't for him, they're, they're you know, highly likely there would not be Bogner amplification Well, I think Reinhold today. got his name somewhat out there when Van Halen was – saying that that's who he would only let look at his amps to fix them early on this is his i never product. even that but I, yeah I don't doubt it yeah, yeah yeah that's how that's how reinhold kind of got his name around the la area anyway was everyone was like oh he was the guy that worked on van halen stuff anyway speaking of amplifiers have you seen the mezza barbas Met, mezza barbas mezza barba no. They're a, a company out of Italy, and I did an interview last week with Howie Simon, um, the guitar player, and Howie's endorsed by Metza Barber. They're great amps. Anyways, Howie <laughs> also mentioned to me a band that I thought you brought up once. He mentioned the band Harem Scarum as putting out one of his all-time favorite records. Harem Scarum, a great Canadian band, a great guitar player. Uh, Pete, I'm going to mispronounce the last name. It's like a uh, Les Perants or something like that. Le, Le Perants or something. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing he's French because they got a lot of you know French Canadians up there. But uh, uh, listen to the song Blue. I think it's off their might be third album. Uh, song called Blue. 
It's yeah. a great video. Watch the video and listen to it. But man, check it out. And then anything live. I mean, I've, I watched some live stuff after I became aware of them. And that guy just smokes. The guitar player is amazing. The band sounds great. They're tight. Singer's got good range. Songs are good. They're, they're just kind of under the radar here in the States. I'm not sure how popular they were in Canada, but a little under the radar. The album that Howie had played, the mu- musicianship is fantastic. I thought the vocals and everything was a little bit dated for its time, like the 93, the record that I listened to, um, Grunge had already stepped in, and it was still trying to hold on to an earlier dated metal. Uh, but I mm-hmm. thought it was very good. Musicianship-wise, it's fantastic. It makes me think, like, a lot of these Canadian bands, I mean, like, remember Saga? They had the oh, brothers yeah. in that band. They had, a, like, great musicianship. I think they had the two hits on American radio. They had On the Loose and Wind Him Up from the album after that. Uh, great stuff, but I, those brothers are great in that band. And there was a lot of great Canadian bands. I mean, other than the, I mean, let's hit the big ones first. You got uh, Rush. What else we got? You got Rush. You got um, Loverboy, you know. Can't forget those guys. I mean, that's they may be a guilty pleasure because you know it's a little cheesy at times. Oh, but great! That first album with Turn Me Loose is awesome. I love them. Yep. And then, um, well, Brian Adams. I mean, Brian Adams, Canadian performer. Yeah. Gino Vanelli. Um, Gino Vanelli, Aldo Nova. I think it, Aldo, it's Canadian. Aldo Nova is Canadian. Yep. Yeah. Um, Triumph. That's right. Rick Emmett, great player, great band. I still. I, you know, I still go back to lay it on the line. Whenever I hear that song, I adjust the game. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I always yeah. liked Allied Forces. And again, it's just because that was just my age of, I used to listen to Allied Forces nonstop at one point. I love that record. Yeah. Now, um, uh, even other... back, you go back further though. The Guess Who, Bachman oh, Turner right. Drive. Yep. A lot of Canadians I like, though. Sarah McLaughlin I love. I love Mm -hmm. her stuff. There was a band called Kick Axe that I believe was Canadian out of the uh, late 80s. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, and uh, there were, I'm going to name two other bands that uh, are a little under the radar here in the States, okay? There's a band called Big Wreck with Ian Thornley. Oh, yeah, yeah. uh, Bingham used to bring them up on the show quite a bit. He loves yeah, that, they, that band. Yeah, they that Ian Thornley guy. He plays amazing, and he sings like Chris Cornell. I mean, so you got like the whole package. I mean, the yeah. guy's just like, he, you, know, you know who else? Just, you know who amazing. else does that? Who's really great is Richie Cotson. Richie Cotson's a smoking guitar player, and he's got a fucking great voice. Yeah, his voice is very soulful, almost. Almost like he almost sounds like he's a black guy in a sense. It's very he's soulful. Great. Yeah. Um, really, you know, he's got, I was watching a new video from him. He's got a video that he did in his house, you know, because of the lockdown. And he's wearing like footy pajamas or something. He's got different ones. One, he's dressed as Spider Man, one, he's dressed as something <laughs> else. And he keeps changing them throughout the video. And it's brand new. It's only like, a, you know, a couple weeks old or something like this. I just saw it yesterday or the day before, something like this. And, you know, typical Richie. I mean, the playing's great. The vocals are great. Does he have a Everything's does he have a show himself at the piano? He has like a red piano. Well, in this, get this, he was in his kitchen. Doing oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he was in his kitchen doing it. So you, so you didn't see the piano. But there's some other videos on that are up now that... There's one of him in his studio. I think there's one of him showing his guitar collection, and they're all somewhat recent. So you'll probably see that piano in there somewhere. Yeah, I think that, it was red. If my memory serves me right, I could be wrong, but I remember it being red. You know what? Yeah, I always thought was interesting about Richie is, you know, he seems to favor a Telecaster, and I, I just didn't, I never would have thunk that. So, yeah, you know, you know what I mean. You know, but he's 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 got that one telly that he's been playing forever. Uh, it's like a tobacco burst with gold hardware or something. And yeah. that goes back to when he was playing in Mr. Big. He, yeah. he was using, you know. But, um, oh, uh, Canadian band, um, Honeymoon Suite. Oh, I loved Honeymoon Suite. Yeah. and, and I that, loved and that the, was, the Big Prize album. Uh, the Big Prize album is killer. Um, the, uh, um, 
Feel It Again would have been the first yes, single. Feel It Again is there. phenomenal. And uh, yeah. if I could fly high, I would. Uh, what oh, does yeah. it take? And actually, that one ended up being on the soundtrack for one of the Lethal Weapon movies. Oh, it is? I love that song. Yeah. I think that record's great. And then you've got Bad Attitude, which yeah. is on that album, which ended up in the final episode of Miami Vice. You oh, know. really? Oh, Feel yeah. It Again was, was great, though. Uh, if you could it, it, just a killer song um really shows off uh Derry Garen, the guitar player if i'm if i'm pronouncing his right, uh, name right and uh interesting thing about him is that old pepsi commercial where they have the guitar player that's playing really fast and the bottle the lid the caps on the bottles are like bubbling you know yeah. and then they they all shoot off or something and this is back to the mid 80s you know back when the hair thing was going on and the guitar player in the video was Derry garen from honeymoon suite but the guy he was just the guy in the video he didn't do the playing even though he's a really good player the guy that played the music in the video, the guitar parts, uh, was Vinnie Moore. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, who's a, who's there was a band, Max Webster. That's not ringing Max a bell with Webster me. Max Webster was the band with Kim Mitchell. Oh, Kim okay. Mitchell. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, go for a soda. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I his like band this before that was Max Webster, and they were really a big band in Canada, but very, virtually unknown in the States. You know what? There's a. Um, uh, you ever seen the movie called Goon? No. Okay. There's a movie called Goon, and uh, it's about uh, hockey. And you know, in, in hockey, um, you know, they really they had these guys they would call the goons, and they were the guys that really weren't good hockey players. But hockey was so rough, they had almost like what they would call enforcers. There would be guys out there that would literally protect the star players, and they would beat the shit out of the opposing team literally they would just beat the guys up and there was a guy um i guess who ended up writing a book about it because he was a goon and they made a movie out of it and uh um it it, it it's a good movie it's on netflix watch it there's also a sequel to it called goon last of the enforcers or something like that it's got a good cast i i'm zoning out on the name of the guy that's the star in the movie but he was in the american pie movies and he was in the Dukes of Hazard movie, and he was in uh, a bunch of other movies. He's 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 a good actor. I like him. But there, there's a Kim Mitchell reference in the Goon movie. Um, one of the guys wanted to start a fight, and actually, it might have been the second Goon movie. Uh, but he he was one of the good guys, and he wanted to start a fight with one of the guys in the opposing team. And uh, um, he asked him if he liked Kim Mitchell. You know, and the guy was like, who? who? And he's like, that's it. And he threw the gloves down <laughs> and, you know, started to take a swing at him. You know, it, it was funny. It was that's funny. hilarious. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I, there's probably a million bands in the Toronto area we're forgetting or not oh, yeah. bringing up. Um, oh, for April sure. Wine. April April Wine is the one that I absolutely love. What's the song called? Is it She Could Be the... This Could Be the Right One. That was like their last hit in 84. I always loved that song. But Nature of the Beast was a great album. The song uh, She's a Roller, which was off an earlier record. I think 78 was a great tune. Uh, they had a lot of great songs. Great band. Wow. They've been around for a long time. I, I, I can go back, I think, as far as 73, they had that first hit. Um, you Could Have Been a Lady. Okay. You know, I remember that shit when I was a... Uh, um, uh, a young lad, you know, learning how to play guitar and playing some of that stuff in a couple of bands. You know, just between you and me, that would have been a little bit later. Yeah, that was Nature of the Beast. Album beast. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Gypsy Queen. One. Gypsy yep, Queen. Same album. Just, just between you and me, all over town. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what else. Miles Goodwin is the guitar player from that band. Yeah. And if we want to talk about if we want to talk about gear, he ended up really liking um, uh, one of his favorite guitars is a Saint Blues guitar. Okay, and the Saint Blues guitar is like a it was a Tele that got mute that got cut down to look a little bit more like a single cut Les Paul bolt on neck, and then um, would have had would have had humbuckers in it at that point, and. Uh, there was a music store that was making these down in Memphis and uh, it was 
strings and things in Memphis, and they were one oh, of the first. Strings and things. Yeah, they were. What they was used the name to, of that they, guitar player in Canada that everybody loved and I never cared for? Played an SG. When I was a kid, everyone was like, uh, oh, oh, Frank, Frank Marino. Marino. Yeah. Marino Mahogany Rush. Yeah. I forgot I never, about those guys. I never cared for them at all. People would always try to tell me. I remember when I was a kid, it was like, check out Frank Marino Mahogany Rush. Check out UFO. Check out Michael Schenker Group. Schenker Group, I loved. UFO, the album Obsession, I really liked. The rest of the catalog... Uh, Lights Out isn't a bad album. It's just not on the level of obsession for me, anyways. And uh, and Frank Marino, I just never. I was like, this sucks. It's like when it reminded me of when people used to tell me about the band ten years after, uh-huh. and they'd be like, that guy's one of the best guitar players. And I would listen to it. I'm like, this is just pentatonic shit, and it just sounds like crap to me. I hated it. As a kid, even, I mean, I'm talking about 13, 14. I was just like, did it, did it, did it, did it. I don't know how many times could I hear the pentatonics? I never cared for that band 10 years after. I never cared for them either. Mahogany Rush, not a fan, not, not really. UFO, a fan though. Michael Shanker, a big fan. Um, favorite UFO album is uh, the Double Live album. Which I'm going to zone out. In the night? Strangers in the night. That album, that is the quint- quintessential UFO album because it's got like basically all of their better songs on it for the most part. And they were they were at the top of their career, you know, you know their creative peak. Uh, uh, Michael Shanker, it's tone, you know. I've always been a, he's one of the in my he's on my short well, list of tone guys. Well, that explains your Marshall collection. Oh yeah, because you listen yeah, to. I yeah, mean, I if you if you listen to the Michael Shanker Group first album, the one that opens up with um, "Armed and Ready." Armed and Ready, I think it isn't in the arena on that album too. Yeah, absolutely, it is. And then yeah. you listen to the album after that, which was just called MSG. Mm-hmm. Those albums, you listen to them. That is like. That could be on Marshall's website as here's what the Sam's going to sound like. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, and you could also throw in Judas Priest British Steel album in there. Yeah, but you know what? You could. Um, I'm not a fan of, I actually like Judas Priest. I like some of their songs. You know, you got another thing coming and heading out on the highway or whatever, you know. Um, But the guitar players, I never thought much of either one of them and or their tones. Yeah. And I'm just being but the British Steel album, you can hear that that is just like a, a 2203 just cranking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know what? Another band that had that quintessential Marshall tone from that era, and you could tell it was just a cranked Marshall with a mic on it, maybe one in the back for an ambient thing or something, um, was the Scorpions. Yeah. Well, yeah, another Shanka. But you got, yeah, but you listen to, uh, a t- what's that song? Uh, Are You Ready to Rock? Or On and On? Or But I Want More off that MSG album? It is like the perfect Marshall tone, if you like Marshall. I'm not a huge Marshall tone fan, but I love that record. I love Shanker's playing on those records. What mm-hmm. I don't like about UFO is I think the melodies are really weird and not very strong it's like lights out it's got this killer dan 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 and then he comes in he's like oh, na, 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 na. it's like what the hell is that for a melody singing the verses are horrible and then lights out and then lights out in london the chorus that's eh, okay but the verses the melodies are so weird everything even his doctor doctor the early stuff he just bothers me. I don't know what that singer's name is, but um, Phil Moog. Yeah, yeah. Phil he Moog. Bought, yeah, is it Moog he or Moog? I thought it was Moog. Did, it might be. Yeah, I'm, I might be mispronouncing it. Yeah, he. Um, I, I never liked those melodies, and then I thought on the Obsession album, I was like, here he is, and it's trying to be a little bit more Zeppelinish, and it works for me. That's interesting. I did not pick up 
any kind of Zeppelin ish oh. stuff. Oh, down, down, go, 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 cool little riff i actually still play that little thing every now and then it's That's like stuck great. in my head yeah here's it is also where you can hear the flaw of the band and ufo they play the intro in the beginning of the song and then they play it in the middle put them next to each other and listen how the tempo difference is like night and day hmm okay i'll have to place. do that i i i may have obsession on on cd I know I've got Strangers in the Night on CD. I'll, I'll have to kind of poke through there and, or just pull it up yeah, on so YouTube, I guess. Like, uh, does, isn't Looking Out for Number One on that record? Just yeah. To, yeah, great song. And then, um, what is it? Is it called You Don't Fool Me? Bound you, don't, down. you Don't Fool Me, um, Pack It Up and Go, oh, which is a real... Pack It Up and Go, just like tune. Um, I'm thinking... Listen to it. Listen to the melodies. It's less like UFO and more like a classic Zeppelin-esque type band. Whereas the earlier stuff, it's it. it there's something with the melodies that bother me. Like he just sings on a weird, like lights out. That verse. Na, 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 na. It's like that's a melody. What the hell are you singing? It just doesn't make it's. I I I'm. I like Phil Moog, 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 whatever. Um, he, his, uh, his range is deceptive. You know, he doesn't sound like he's singing high because he's, he's kind of like a full, th full throat voice, you know. And, uh, but he actually, you know, that it's fairly high. Not that that has anything to do with it, but, um, you know, he's unique, you know, and, and I'll UFO take was. Hard and all day. You will take what? I'll take Gary Barden all day. Who's Gary Barden? He was the singer in the Michael Shanker group on the first, second, and fourth album. Oh, okay. He sang um, all yeah, the he songs. Yeah, he, he went through different people, and uh, I didn't pay attention to them at that point. I, with me and Shanker, it kind of... It started to peter off after that 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 second album. I guess I was I, I was chasing something else at that point. All right, let, let me you let know. me tell you this. Go back and listen to MSG from 1981. It opens up with uh, "Are You Ready to Rock," and um, it's got on and on on the album. But I think just tone wise of that guitar and song wise, I think it's Schenker's best work. It's a perfect album. It's well, um, you know, I'm a huge Shanker fan. He's he's on my short list of players, and that's so I'm not gonna, you know, I don't have anything no, bad no, to say about. Oh, no, I, no, I, no, you have to check it out. Listen to. It. I don't. Do you use Spotify? Not really. It's yeah. free. You don't have to subscribe. Go on Spotify and just look up MSG Michael Shanker Group, and you can listen to the whole album while you're on your computer. Just well, I, um, I'll probably just do that on YouTube because you can do it on YouTube too. Right. I mean, yeah. There, there's always someone throwing shit up on YouTube. And yeah. with that being said, there's some great live footage of UFO from 1995 when they were doing a reunion tour. And it's by some, the guy that threw it up is like Axe Fly or something like that is his uh, handle on YouTube. That's his name. And, uh, it it's I think it's from Chicago or something where they're they're playing in Chicago and it's the original lineup, uh, you know Pete Way and Phil right. Moog, Moog, whatever, and Michael Shanker and, and and what have you, and um, they fucking sound great, you know. Pardon my friend. Well, the only reason uh, why I say it is because um, there used to be a, a a goalie here on the Bruins with the last name Moog, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I watched, there's an old, um, to tell the truth. Do you remember that show? Oh, yeah. And there's one with the, with the keyboard Moog guy. I forget his first name. Is it, what the hell is his first name? Robert Moog. And he, and they, yeah, he, he corrects him and says Moog. Oh, okay. Yeah. I actually repped that product for a while. Moog. Oh, did? Moog products. Yeah. I think it was Robert. They, they actually had come out with the guitar when I was repping their their product, and they they had all the the guts in the guitar. 
Oh, I remember and, it. Yeah. And I, I remember they came out with it in the early 2000s. And, um, yeah, well, let me see. At that point, it would have been somewhere between 2003 and 2006 or seven right, or yeah. something. Yeah. You know, and um, when the guitar came out, I, I remember, you know, being at the factory, they were showing it to all of us and uh, looking for our input and stuff like that. And I just remember thinking to myself, and you're you're kind of missing the boat, at least cosmetically they were, you know, because right. at that point it wasn't about a pretty shiny flame top. It wasn't about gold hardware. Right. It wasn't about anything, anything that they were doing. And, uh, you know, try to tell them that, but you know, I didn't want to hear it, you know? Right. And, uh, they, they definitely had some bad Intel, like on things that were going on oh, yeah. at that point. I had written, I, I already had worked for Gibson. I, I had left Gibson, and they thought that Gibson was really going to come out with this Ethernet guitar, you know, because it, it, it was using that kind of a jack. And um, uh, Henry never did anything with that technology. They were playing around with it, and uh, but they were never going to do anything with it. And uh, well, all the stuff Gibson did with technology was always jammed down people's throats. Nobody wanted it, but Henry was like, This is the future. It's like, It's your future, buddy. This is why you're going to get kicked out of your own company. He always would try to push shit nobody wanted. That's the problem with the whole guitar industry is everyone trying to make a better mousetrap. And then they're like, Oh, but look, now you can get rid of, uh, you know, things you don't want to get rid of. It's just, it's, it, it's a lot of, you're making something people didn't ask for. So, the, and, so, so they're, they're, they're trying to fix something that's not broke necessarily. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. We are uh, going to call this one. It's getting late here. And I will see you next week. I enjoyed this one. And I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, have a great week. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Very good. Very good.